Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where in the world you are joining us from today. I would like to thank you all for spending the next hour with our fantastic hosts and panelists. So I would like to get started with a few housekeeping notes. So today's discussion is delving into the digitalization of the consumer car buying experience. Partnered with Salesforce and we have a fantastic host of guests from Servco Pacific Inc and 3Kit. So I would like to start off by letting you know that we have a Q&A box on your screen. Simply tap on the Q&A box and ask all of your questions over the next hour. We will try to get through as many as possible. So please do get your questions in early to avoid disappointment. So I would like to hand over to Kayla Reynolds, the Industry Intelligence Analyst at Cox Automotive, who is today's host. Thank you so much, Kayla. Thank you, Haley, and thank you so much for having me. I'm excited today to moderate a discussion surrounding the digitization of the consumer car buying experience. Today, we'll be going into detail about market dynamics driving change in the customer car buying journey, what this journey will look like, and how automotive manufacturers and dealers can accelerate their transformation. Again, my name is Kayla Reynolds, and I'm an automotive industry intelligence analyst at Cox Automotive. For those who are not familiar with Cox Automotive, we are a conglomerate of 20 or more automotive companies and brands, with our two most well-known being Auto Trader and Kelly Blue Book. We don't build vehicles, but we touch nearly every point of the vehicle life cycle once it leaves the factory. Enough about me though, I would love now to introduce the amazing panelists we have today. I'll begin with the Salesforce team. That includes Matthew Simpkins, Senior Director and Industry Advisor. Aaron Sunando, Vice President of Commerce, Cloud, Go-To Market and Transformation. In addition to our Salesforce team, we have two wonderful panelists who I would love for them to give a background on themselves and their companies following my introduction of them. We have Peter Duher, Senior Vice President of Digital at Servco Pacific Inc. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, good morning, everyone. And then we have Matt Borniak, CEO at 3Kit. Morning, good afternoon, lovely to be here. To begin with, I'd love to discuss the market dynamics driving change in the customer car buying journey. You all should be able to see a visual of the ecosystem supplied by Matt Simpkins. So Matt, to begin with the discussion, what has been top of mind of industry players as they went through the pandemic? Thanks Kayla and thanks everyone for joining the, uh, the discussion today. I mean, I think, the number one thing is, is the industry has gone through huge disruption, as we all know, in the, in the last 12 months. And really, a lot of it has come down to how people have responded based on values, right? The, the need for resilience, the need for trust, which was you know, one of the key features that came out of the Cox Automotive study, but also the need to make it easy to do business with, right? Once the physical retailers were, were closed down, how, how could we digitize the car buying experience and how could we make that experience as, as easy to do as possible? And really what you see, what you see here in, in the visual is, is there were a number of different you know, direct to consumer or, or, or sales channel models that are opening up. It's, it's not as simple as just spinning up an e-commerce site and, and putting your stock online as, as we all know. But for many of the OEMs in, in the kind of the traditional build to order and configurator space, they're now starting to look at how do they, how do they increase um, acquisition and engagement at, at, at the top of the funnel. How do they get more data and enrichment and, and insight through the, through the lead management and, and sales funnel itself? And then ultimately with all of that data, how does that transpire into a more personalized ownership experience? But what's been really interesting, I think in, in, in the retail space is that if we look at kind of the used car market or what we call kind of you know, lo locate to order, there's been a real disruption in, in, in the retail space. And, and, and for dealerships, they've had to figure out Okay, how can we really move the model online? And you know, really looking forward to having that discussion with with, with Peter as part of this call. Um, but what we're seeing in this space as well, right, is is a number of new entrants coming in and trying to disrupt this digitally. And it's a really exciting battleground between new entrants trying to make a lot of noise and and all of the existing players saying, "Well, hold, hold on a minute, we can we can meet them in this space too." And then if that wasn't if that wasn't enough disruption, we've we've got the shift now to electric vehicles and, and the huge acceleration that we've seen. You know, it's been a topic of conversation for for probably half a decade now. But um, you know, as we, as we all know, and all of the announcements that have come from all of the major OEMs, we we've reached that that tipping point. 
and and with the evolution of, of the actual physical products so there's been an evolution in the sales channels that, that go with it and then finally you know what we talk around from from a services perspective it's not just the traditional services that we see with extended warranty service plans you know and paint protection you know, OEMs are now able to, to deploy software and features o over the air, just as we, we have today with our Apple and Android phones. And there's now a question around, well, how do we how do we monetize and optimize those services, not just the physical asset? So there are there are these kind of four key uh, models that, that are all evolving simultaneously. And, and, and that's creating disruption, but it's also creating you know, real opportunity. Thanks, Matthew. I think this is a perfect transition to ask Peter, what industry trends and challenges are you currently seeing? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Kayla, for the question. And good morning and good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, just a little context, uh, we're here in Hawaii. Uh, so we're uh, just starting our morning here in, uh, as part of Team Servco, uh, which I joined uh, a little over two years ago. I have a relatively new automotive background predominantly here in Servco. My background came before from e-commerce and apparel for many years in New York City. And so one of the great things that we're seeing and I'm learning on a daily basis from a disruption perspective is just how other industries' consumer expectations are impacting how transportation consumers go through the buying process for a new used vehicle, go through service, the expectations in the bar are really high. And as Matt was saying, we had to look at it from three areas as um, consumer behavior is where it all starts. So we're trying to take a very consumer centric view of, of what's happening from an industry perspective. And we see that from how people purchase vehicles. Uh, there's the street e-commerce plays, which are growing great in our space and really, you know, raising the bar for both for the OEMs, for the tier two, tier three uh, throughout, throughout the world. Um, and just how people use vehicles as well you know, with, with traditional ownership, as well as morphing, um, mechanisms like car sharing or ride hailing. We also have a car share startup here in Hawaii, which has been a great learning ground for us to see how transportation needs are evolving. And it's a very app-based experience. So also just everything's tethered through your phone, as we all know. And so how do we continue to express experiences for our customers that cater to where they are, you know, meet them in their part of the journey, how they want to be met exactly in that moment. And that essentially that pivots to what we talked to as an omni-channel experience for how do we engage with our customers across all these selling points now. Uh, predominantly we'll talk today about digital, but really digital is a thread for all the traditional selling points as well as new points that may not even be front and center today like voice or something that could be coming shortly. And then mobility as a service, how does that fit in from a consumer expectation? And then when we look at that, we look at all the disruptions happening in and around the vehicles with regard to the connected vehicles in space and what that technology is doing to drive engagement in the car, tethered to your phone throughout, um, be, well beyond just driving the car, as well as what does that, all that data mean in terms of analyzing your behavior as a driver and how to use that for more predictive analytics around your shopping patterns, service patterns, maybe cross shopping marketplace patterns with other uh, consumable goods. And then as the drive trains continually go more electrified or and hybrid and electrified. Uh, what does that do in terms of just expectation around what does the vehicle mean, all the content and re education around, around, the, around the product set? You know, so really going back to leaning heavily on, on content creation, syndication, localization, and personalization. And then, of course, autonomous, you know, further out, you know, so I, I, we know that's coming at some point. What does that do to disrupt our value chain as dealers and operators um, in this space? And then Again, we're a distributorship as well as a dealership. And uh, how does that just all impact what we do every day? <clears throat> so how, do, how does that change how vehicles get serviced as they evolve in their drivetrains? Uh, what does that mean in terms of retooling our teams to use these new digital imprints to engage with our customers and move them in their journey propagation in a more cohesive way? And what does that do in terms of taking more traditional siloed aspects of our operations and merging them together from a customer-centric perspective? And building more richer relationships over that life cycle. So that's how we see it all playing together. And it's super exciting because you know we think there's a lot of great disruption too, and just investment in the space for a lot of startups and venture funds and other things that we're trying to learn from, you know, what's happening out there that we could either test into. So what we always say we don't have the answer, but we're trying to uh, formulate it around the mindset of agility and where we can really test into some of these concepts with our customers and our operators. 
and take feedback really in, in short intervals. And from there, we can continue to iterate and adapt. And that goes back to kind of then it's like, what do we need from a platform and investing in other people and from other perspectives to enable that to happen? Thanks, Peter. And I know you mentioned previously um, about data. So we did have a question come in regarding legacy data. Um, and from those closed loop auto systems like CDK, how are you guys handling that? Yeah, so that was, that's been one of our biggest challenges from the outset is, is really, if we're gonna take a customer centric view, we need to understand who our customer is within all of our operational data stores. So whether that's our lead management or affiliate systems where a lot of our, our traffic is coming into our you know, wholly owned websites to our internal CRM, to our dealer management system, to the service system. As you can imagine, they're all, uh, they're all purpose built for their, their, their operational benefit, yet the customer data is duplicated across all of that. And so we try, and then when we have multiple rooftops, like we do the rooftop, as kind of the center of those systems. And so when you have a customer that's traversing multiple destinations, it becomes quite difficult to, to tie back to a centralized customer view. So our first um, investment was really to look at a customer data platform approach to it. So letting the operational data stores do what they do best and not trying to sync all of that information, clean up the customer data at rest. We came across a solution that allowed us to pull that information into a more AI driven approach to cleanse it and create a unique identifier for the customer across all those touch points. And we keep layering in. So you know, our email marketing platform, which is Salesforce, we're layering in all the engagement data for that same customer. So now we can see behavior as well as clickstream data is coming in, as well as all of those transactional data stores. It's really allowed us to keep the legacy data sets doing what they do best. And but when we're talking to the customer, whether it's through app on marketing or, or look like modeling and social, or if it's in store when we're trying to pick up where the customer left off when they generated an, an online impression for in, inquiry on, on a sale or a trade, we're able to pull that information into the process now and see, okay, this customer bought three Toyotas before, their lifetime value is X, we can use that to the preferred sales consultant is Y, and we can start to hopefully build more meaningful and engagements with that customer. Um, wherever they are in, 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 in a journey with us. And within that journey, I know that during COVID-19 and the pandemic, we've seen that a lot more consumers are doing research online and much of the car buying journey online now. Um, what impact have you seen that regarding the volume and importance of shoppers at least having some type of interaction with the dealership, such as a phone call or you know, some getting face-to-face -face interaction in that journey? Yeah, it's just essential. I mean, we're we're big believers. All of this technology is really meant to amplify that human interaction, not replace it, not not take, not have an alternative. And so, especially in COVID, when we were shut doors and we had no as aspect but to come up with processes to take purchases, deliver home, take trades from home, bring them back. Uh, we worked really closely with our dealer operators with the platforms we were standing up, and we had to really accelerate in, in, in like light speed. Uh, due to the continuity that we needed for our business to figure out processes that kept that relationship really strong, but use the tools and technology to reduce some friction on both sides. So we can pick up where the customer's needs were left off. And when we had to make an engagement, whether it's call or text, and right now we've been getting into conversational commerce using more elevated chat experiences. You know, we're, we're all about creating all the channels of convenience. They all tie back to a human on, on some on some aspect, whether it's our call center for service or service technician when you come in a day or in the sales process, it could be one of multiple um, of our sales consultant team uh, and our marketing team as well. So we're using that. It all comes back also to that fundamental data platform where we're taking that customer, those customer moments, and we're always stitching them back to that that elongated, let's call it like record of, of who that customer is so we can have more meaningful conversations to move them further in a journey knowing where they left off, uh, whether it's an online conversation, an in-person conversation, or, or some hybrid thereof. Perfect. Thank you so much, Peter. And regard, this is going to be a question for Matthew. Um, I know single custom view was mentioned previously. Was that something that was implemented in Salesforce? And if so, um, which cloud was it implemented on? 
Yeah, sure. Happy. I'm happy to answer this along, along probably with Aaron. But um, yeah, this a, a, absolutely. And it kind of goes back to the, the, the system of record and, and, and closed systems. And I guess what I would say the last 12 months is that a lot of uh, automotive software partners are recognizing the need to open their systems and, and, and to play well with others because the customer experience, back to Peter's point, d demands it, right? In order to give a, a friction that's easy to do business with, um, kind of experience you, you, you've got to share and open open that data but yes you know at, at the core Salesforce provides that system of engagement and that single view of the customer um, you know in, in, in Pete's instance it's, it's a combination of, of sales cloud and, and, and commerce cloud but you know we're seeing customers use marketing and, and service as well because it's, it's about the complete experience right there's no point having a great digital interaction at the top of the funnel and then post-purchase it, fall, it falling off the edge of the cliff. So, you know, it's it's a modular approach and, and Aaron will talk to this a little bit more in, in, later on in, in the session. It, it, it can be a modular approach and it can be a scalable approach. Hopefully that, that answers the, the question, but good to see them coming in. It does, Matthew, thank you so much. I think this is a perfect segue for us to discuss what this customer car buying journey will look like. As you can see, we have another visual for that. And I'd love to start with asking Aaron, can you discuss what the automotive maturity and evolution model looks like? Sure. And uh, I just changed my background to look a little bit more like Hawaii because I am wishing I'm there with Peter. Uh, wearing my Aloha, the best I could do is wear my Aloha shirt and change my background. The 100% wish I was in Hawaii with Servco and Peter right now, right? Um, so we have a model and a, a perspective on um, the maturity model here, right? And as we've um, seen, um, you know, the industry evolve. And I feel so grateful to be working in commerce uh, at this, you know, at, at this time, because, um, you know, we've seen acceleration and transformation move from years to months and months to weeks, you know, as um, many corporations and consumers evolve through the pandemic, right? I mean, just a massive amount of innovation, creativity, adaptivity, right? People pushing the boundaries, uh, and so what we've seen is this evolution where, you know, we've seen a lot of players, both OEMs and dealerships, right, moving really from stage one to stage two very quickly from being relatively, you know, focused on content to really adapting a concept of like a product carousel, right, and be able to kind of show products. Um, but again, even at that stage, it's, it's just being able to just show uh, products. So if you think about an e-magazine or an e-brochure type of thing, right? Um, but it's still missing, you know, a lot of the things that e-commerce can provide, right? So if, for example, a prospect was to go into a site and browse and, you know, typically for car buying, people don't sit there and say, I'm going to go buy a car, right? They'll probably go to a few sites, they go out, they read some content, do some research, go back to the site, right? So it's a back and forth customer journey. And so today, what happens is that if you don't leave an email address or you don't leave your phone number, right? you as a prospect are gone forever, right? But we know that in the world of e-commerce, right? The, the concept of the anonymous shopper and the ability to retarget is so key, right? To be able to kind of retarget that abandoned journey. So what we're really kind of, you know, seeing is, is a massive amount of push. And this is where Salesforce and our partners can really support is this push towards stage three, four, and five, right? So stage three, and probably uh, after listening to what Peter said, a couple of missing bullets yeah. there, right, would be, uh, uh, personalization and omni-channel, right? But certainly the ability to kind of really push towards a proper um, consumer-focused search and merchandising, retargeting. And then something that, you know, I know we're going to talk to Matt Gorniak about is then moving towards this headless experience, right? The concept of augmented reality, social commerce, live shopping, right? And then ultimately then going into mobility as a service, loyalty, marketplaces, um, you know, um, influencers, right? So how do you get each one of your, your customers, your drivers to be a brand advocate for you, right? And how do you weaponize that, you know, massive amount of people who are actually touching your products every day to be able to be a brand advocate for you, right? And so this is beyond just the product carousel. This, And we're also seeing a lot of push for people wanting to migrate. And I'd love to have Peter, you know, speak about this, moving off point solutions that will give singular uh, capabilities to actually moving more towards a platform mindset and a growth mindset, right? And so that's kind of like what we're seeing the evolution. Yes, yeah, we, we're firm believers at Team Surfco in adopting a growth mindset as a 
two-year-old company, uh, and we have a saying, you know, you, we have to adapt, otherwise we'll be on our way to, to dying. And so, that, you know, having a fixed mindset, even when you, when you layer it down to like a technology perspective, uh, will only get us so far. So a platform approach is essentially how, when we look at like our three pillars of transformation, we, data is everything. So we, we really want to focus on building a culture around data-driven journeys uh, on our customer side and using analytics platforms and visualization, visualization platforms like Tableau for really harnessing that information in new ways and give that and democratize that back within your organization. And then in the middle is really, I think Matt said about reducing friction. So how do we just realize the customers are going to be engaging with us at all channels in a fixed mindset, right? In a fixed platform, those channels are going to be very difficult to, to merge together and, and carry on a, a, a congruent and cohesive conversation. So having a platform approach where those channels can easily pass information to and, to and fro and know that it's a it's not a linear pass, right? When we shop, it's an inherently non-linear experience. I mean, we have people that come in at the trade and then they'll come back to discovery or they'll come in at transact and they'll move all the way back to engagement. Uh, they'll start in service, so as we all know, as operators. And then uh, the platform for agility and growth, it's, it's really, you know, the technology is a great foundation. Yeah, it's investing in our people. So we've done a lot. And we continue to do so is uh, adopt an agile mindset within our organization, as well as provide opportunities for internal team members, as well as look at opportunities to bring in uh, team members with different perspectives. Like myself, I, you know, come from a very different background in terms of commerce. Um, similarly, we have people coming into our space who came from the gaming industry, and we'll talk a bit about that when we get to um, 3 kit and, and some of the advanced merchandising concepts. But really just the idea is really, we're constantly want to be experimenting and uh, and, adapt, and adapt to that growth mindset. And then when I look at that chart that Euron mentioned, we're probably some, we, two years ago, we were probably in probably stage one to two with COVID. We're, we're squarely kind of playing within stage three and trying to stay, take some things from the future stages, like I mentioned before, to help meet some of those disruption factors that are, are right here within our within our industry, and some of the things we've tried to do to support that is is take more of a R and D and a, you know a hackathon type of approach to test into concepts that we can see if we can get something to ship in a you know, using agile mindset like an MVP uh, with our internal team or with our our end consumer we can really iterate and measure if that's having an impact or not, and um, you know having a and a measure everything mentality is super critical too, as you migrate through those stages, because if we can't measure it, it's really hard to, to make a case for the investment. And I think we have a saying, if we can't measure it, why do it? Thanks, Peter. I think that's the perfect transition to ask Matt from 3Kit. Um, where do you see technologies like 3D um, and AR playing a role in the customer buying experience for the automotive industry? Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I would say for the consumer industry in general, and we see the trends play out in auto just as well. So 3K, just a headline, we're an immersive uh, visuals platform, um, essentially help you to take the um, your digital product experience to the next level. Um, and I just want to give you that background because in its scale, the scale is a challenge for brands. Let me, let me just say a couple headlines or like, context. So we're obviously all aware of the super cycle that COVID-19 kicked in. I mean, that's, that's why we're here. So nothing new there, but it's really interesting when most customers or prospects I talk to about the digital product experience, I think the perception is that that is a picture on the website, just it's digital and there's your product, but that's changed completely with the pandemic. And in many ways, and I say this is in many ways, it's a digital is a better way to do it anyway. And I think you've seen this across customer, you'll see this play out. Let me give you some specific examples. So when you really dig in, what customers want, and, and I, Peter, you said this, like meet me, meet me where I am, right? I think that's all as customers can relate to that. I mean, that's, it's always been about the customer. So when we speak about the digital product experience, um, I call it a digital feel. Like I want the product digitally. I want to feel it. I want to experience it. So 3D is a huge part of that. And by the way, all the things I'm about to tell you, they're very doable today. It's not the art of the possible. It's it's being done. So this is not futures. We'll talk about the futures. I want to delineate here in a minute. Um, 
but it's a better experience. I'll give you an example. Um, why wouldn't you or I want to show my partner the car I'm about to buy in my driveway? It's dual. I, I want that. I want to try all the cars out. Like meet me where I am. And um, ideally, COVID nineteen passes, right? Which would be wonderful for the world. I still want that now. It's a better experience for me, right? To start kind of trying things out, get consensus at home, just to give you a sense for that. And when I mean digital experience, I truly mean like co-creation. It's another thing, by the way, you'll, you'll notice uh, our, our customers say, when you're able in 3D to express your products, um, a co-creation mechanism kicks in. Meaning as a buyer, I'm starting to engage with the product in a whole new way, right? I, I'm, I'm playing with them, I'm, I'm investing time in it. Um, uh, by the way, another theme Matthew and I talked about prior to the panel was personalization. And by the way, that's happening already in consumer sports, for instance, we have customers like there, you can configure a driver to, to, to such a um, detail level that we have got comments from our customers sake. People, again, this is co-creation or, or furniture. So that's all being done in automotive. I would love to do that as well. You know, so I, I just want to tell you that is something as a consumer I bring over. The other one is, so the digital field. The other one is, I would say, um, place the car in my environment. Like for instance, one of the features we do, we can we can generate a digital um, rendering of that of the car I just like configured in my city, in my street. Why not place it in my driveway for me? I mean, the images are available. Once you understand what's what's available technology wise at scale, it really changes the way you go to market. Um, Another one is back to personalization, you know, cars today, you know, obviously we can personalize them to a degree, but, but I don't know where the dealership comes in versus the brand. That's probably something Peter can speak to or Matthew, but like, for instance, um, I would like to personalize mine further, right? I'd like to go further. It's doable in sports in other products. Why can't I not, um, you know, my, my seats, you know, let's just say I want to, I want to have something stitched in there. And I know this is being done uh, at high end cars, super high end. But when I bring it, not bring it to the masses, right? I think that creates that um, loyalty. Um, the other one, you know, is is also like um, Aaron, you had um, on, on the slide, a virtual concierge. So again, you know, imagine digital product experience. I can I can feel the product, right? The entire breadth of the uh, options right here. I can place it in my environment. And then there's a concierge. And we think of concierge many times as, as a chat bot. And that could be that. But how about someone actually grabs the, no pun intended, wheel, as I'm creating it and starts helping me co-creating this car. We see this in other industries, consumer products. Hey, do you have any questions? Here, let me help you along this journey. Oh, cool, thanks for shaping this. This is, in, uh, for instance, in, in, in housing. Uh, if you wanna create a kitchen or, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an artist, a specialist. Again, really interesting opportunity for the brand or the dealerships to kind of help me along the way. So, so the point I'm trying to make it is I, I um, we see this in our demand um, that the digital product experience that next level is here to stay. It creates much better consumer opportunities. No, it's not going to make the dealership go away. I think it's kind of that new normal. I think it makes it better. Um, mm -hmm. I can talk about the futures in a minute, but I think I just want to set the stage a little bit for what that really does and consumers want it um, from what we're hearing. So, Thanks, Matt. After hearing that, Peter, what with those new emerging technologies and experiences, um, how do you think that will impact the market, competitors, or even peers? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's, uh, I don't have an answer. I, I know we, I would advise to start experimenting if you haven't already with, with them. Um, I mean, I think uh, it was a great point. I mean, the consumers do expect this from other industries. Uh, as we know, you know your furniture has been a pretty leader in, in using different types of augmented reality. And as the iPhone becomes even easier and more sophisticated with how that is represented in, in the physical space, it's just going to get easier. You know, I, I think once AR kit came out with, I forget which iOS version it was, but you start to see a lot of interesting development in, in this space. And I think also, as you look at the generation coming up with, uh, with um, Okay, you know, the gaming generation and esports, and um, I think automotive has done a really great job in certain spaces and rendering in, in, in that field. And as that becomes more open to the web and it's less proprietary in a, in a certain platform and more accessible, it's easier to test into it at a lower cost. And I think with that, we can see um, 
the benefit of it. From a personalization perspective, uh, without a doubt, I mean, in our market, um, you know, Tacoma is our leading seller and the, a large percentage of them get some degree of personalization, whether it's, it's, it's wheels and trim, it could be lifting, it could be um, wrapping, it could be some, you know, accessorizing it to really personalize it uh, on the road is, is a big customer uh, delight. And, we're, you know, we're doing it in, and supporting that in certain ways, even not OEMs come around to supporting some of the lift kits and keeping them on warranty, which was one of the challenges initially. And there's a great demand for that. And, but being able to visual, visualize that in a way that uh, the customer can engage with that, with that before coming into the showroom, which right now is where we have them, you know, um, ready for display. It just extends the reach. Uh, so how do we render that? Because it, it, as we know, merchandising within automotive, uh, for most of us is a challenge. Um, you know, we have people who set the bar like Carvana and, and, and how the, the vehicles are really, really great I mean, merchandise taken from other industries. Uh, we still rely on a lot of third-party data aggregators for, for basic imagery. So when you want to get to a trim level or a customization level that or present those options and then present a buying pattern for that, uh, it's a huge opportunity uh, and definitely think it's, it's, it's going to be an, an impact if, if not ready for, um, for where we need to focus our attention. Yeah. I, if you don't mind, I'll build on that a little bit, Peter, because we have been talking about the new car experience, right? So I think we can, I mean, we can spend an hour on this. <laughs> I, I definitely could, because there's so many ways to, uh, to go about this. And, and I think the biggest thing is um, a, an automobile is a consumer product. So it's the same trends. I mean, I think that's sort of the underlying, but let me flip the conversation a little bit to the post purchase, what we see with, digital product experience, um, the concept of what do I own, right? Once I purchase a product generically, let's say a car, where does it exist, right? So we're seeing that demand by customers for self-service, like show me the product I purchased, like show me my car, and then maybe I'd like to buy some aftermarket parts, but I don't want to look at a parts list. I don't want to like fish that around and go through the web and, and kind of figure out, stitch it together. It's literally the experience. Like, show me my car, show me what I can add to it. You know what I mean? My car, my product. And we see as a consumer quite a bit. And that kind of translates also into parts. Like to purchase a, from a light bulb on, on your car could be a couple hours worth of adventure <laughs> of just searching for that. So I think what we're seeing for customers is one, meet me where I am. And the, the, the second portion that is like, Hey, the product I purchased, like show it to me. I want to see it. I don't want to see part numbers or the VIN number. Show it to me. Let me uh, interact with it. Let me then, whatever you allow me to, let me then um, transact, augment. But that's a huge missing piece that we uh, get um, a lot of conversations when we get engaged with uh, automotives. That's a very, very big part to uh, allow customers to uh, to be able to do that. So um, some of kind of the post um, experience. Yeah, I think I think just to add to, to Matt's point, I think there's a whole and, and we have got a couple of questions on this as well. So a whole area called guided selling, right? That obviously is other industries like retail, for example, and to some extent financial services have been really good at in terms of being able to kind of tell you towards a guided selling to help you kind of pick the right product, right? For the for for the right purpose. I think automotive is still at the stage of throwing things at you, right? And say, you know, and they're assuming people know the difference between a T5 and a T6, or, you know, even, you know, a four wheel drive versus an all wheel drive, right? And, and there's just so much assumption. There's so much inward focused product as opposed to looking at the customer perspective, right? And the guided selling, helping them to get to the right product, you know, at, you know, for the right needs, for example, right? And Matt, to your point about the post-purchase, uh, when I was in, in Japan, there was a company that whose whole, purpose and why they exist is to get rid of manuals so they basically that's their purpose in life and so what they want to do is actually they build video tutorial snippets about how do you make a uh, tempura shrimp right so they can send it to you know chefs and stuff right and all these things they just want to get rid of manuals and paper all, all as a whole right and so i'd love i think your your company like three can would be you know would be perfect for those kind of things and also the consumer experiences Everyone wants to watch a video and I don't want to read stuff, right? And, and you know, when, when I get shipped with like this, this thick of a manual in my car, I probably never open it. I'll just go online and look at some things, right? right? So so I uh, totally agree with you. Thank you for elaborating on that, Aaron. But that's a perfect transition 
into discussing how automotive manufacturers and dealers can accelerate their transformation. Um, I'll begin with asking Peter, in your own evolution journey, what would you say are the biggest hurdles that you guys have encountered? I think, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of solutions out there. And so it's easy to, to lead with a solution. And so, it, it, and we continue to go through this, let's take more of a, a value stream approach to it. And, you know, keep, we keep coming back to what problem are we trying to solve for the customer? Does it exist today? Is it a problem within our operations even as well to, to drive efficiency? And from there, we can do some degree of journey mapping and value stream mapping to start to see where the opportunity set is. And the solutions will come out of that, but we, we're trying to spend a lot more time on problem definition and deconstructing the problem and prioritizing which ones are important to go after because then we'll know we're spending our, our resources, which are, well, I think we would all agree, it's, we don't have unlimited resources on the things that would hopefully derive the, the biggest benefit. And then from there, we can, we can develop a more iterative approach to continue to work down the list or, or scale things that are, are working great or, or the things that we know are off course, you know, let's, let's fail fast on those. Um, so that's, that's a, big, a big aspect of it. I mean, with all of this, I think it comes down to our team and our people and, and tying back to that growth mindset, which is support to us as an organization and then trying to find ways to give voice to everyone to kind of present ideas because our, I don't have the answer for sure. I mean, we're, we're trying to present a platform, but getting those ideas and that input from the customer as well is really important, whether it's through the, the relationships with the sales consultants or directly outreaching to the customers in different ways to get their feedback. Um, and that's that's been really helpful. So, and staying curious about everything else that's happening. I think within Serco, we do look outside a lot, even outside of automotive for inputs, you know, and then I think Matt made a great point you know, in round two on just some of the things like assisted selling or, or per, real, really where personalization is driving other industries um, and being really impactful. Uh, how, how would that apply to our industry? You know, so trying to make those corollaries and staying inquisitive about it. And then as consumers, right? What are the things we enjoy most, right? I mean, I, mean, I, love, I love that Netflix just knows me, you know, I love when I go on Amazon and it, it's just so simple. Uh, so, okay, this, can we take the best of those personalization concepts of really good localized rich content and an easy an easy frictionless experience and how do we correlate that to any part of what we do whether it's buying a car doing a trade servicing our customer um or not even doing a purchase just just sharing content around your new vehicle and being more educational and building moments within the transactional points that create a better relationship with our brand um and i think yeah i think another Area, I think we, we hit on, uh, you know, how to really amplify the human interaction yet drive efficiency through that process. So uh, I think we want to respect everyone's time, our customers first and foremost, yet, yet within the operation when it gets really busy, how do we make it easier for them? Because it, it's a net effect that's going to impact how much time we can devote and, and personalize that experience when they are in store with the customer, whatever that is, purchase, sale, trade. Um, and so that's, that's super important. Uh, and then I think on the, the merchandising side, we keep coming back to it. I think it's a big opportunity uh, on that front. And I think as we uh, continue to look at more and more business searching for wanting to reserve or our, our purchase inventory online and other industries where Omni and distributed order management are work really well when the stores are nodes, you know, onto this virtual pool of inventory. And there's really good interaction to move the inventory around on behalf of the customer. That's still a big opportunity in our space. I mean, we, we have kind of some of that working, but this, when you think of the inventory in a lot versus in a central repo and how do we trade new and used and get, just get the customer to what they want within our, within our, within our framework. Um, I think there's, there's a lot in our space that can, that can evolve to support that. If I can just uh, build on the, the thing that uh, Peter mentioned, right? So Peter's 100%, I, I totally agree, right? Like a lot of the consumer expectations are going to be driven and set by their experiences outside our automotive, right? He mentioned mm -hmm. Netflix, Amazon, right? These are digital experiences that we have been trained in. Now with the pandemic, we saw massive behavior shifts to kind of depend on online commerce. And a lot of this is going to set the brain to, to expect certain things when you go to a website, right? And that's not going to go away, right? And so the benchmark is no longer my competitor in my industry. My benchmark is now 
um, Adidas, right? You know, that's like my benchmark, right? For example. So um, I think, you know, that's a hundred percent true. The, the other one, I, I actually had a question um, to Peter is the industry today has a lot of very single point solutions, uh, Peter. And I think, you know, when I talk to multiple partners and customers, there's sometimes there's a gold rush to kind of go after the bright, shiny object that can solve one problem or like, you know, it provides one solution only does it for that, but it does it really, really well. How did you at Servco kind of figure it out that like, those are great, but we should think wider and longer beyond just the point solution. Like, you know, how, at what point do you, did, did you guys uh, sort of got to that? That's a great question. Well, we, uh, like you said, we saw it evolve from in other spaces, right? If I take retail, for example, you know, 12 years ago that, you know, we we're kind of starting these concepts of omni-channel and what does that mean and have the stores and the catalog and the phone and the website all, all work together. And, and it was same story, a lot of point solutions, a lot of purpose-built, you know, we'll solve this for today. Um, so really to work hard to try and figure out, okay, well, what's a model that A, focuses on where the customer behavior is trending. And so how do we work back from that? Where, what problems do we have meeting the customer in that space and reducing friction along that, those journey points? And from there, we can start to think of, you know, okay, what is that? What are the gating factors from, our, from how we're structured today to support that from a, from, a training perspective, from a, a platform perspective, from a process perspective, and starting to really, and it goes back to that value stream, like where, where is the most important thing? For us, it started at, at, we really needed to do a better job understanding where all of our customer data was, how did we tie it together and, and create a single view of that customer. And then we can start to build a 360 view of that customer as they engage with different moments in all of these channels that are now you know, front and center in our, in our operations. And so, and we're, I think, uh, so we kind of, we didn't solve for it with a super platform that's going to do everything, but we kind of, we took it up a level. And I do think headless is, is a, which we, was when I left apparel was starting to really take off in certain spaces is a nut is kind of the next evolution of it. You know, how do we start to look at the best, the best thing that this system does is an algorithm that does, you know, the client service recommendations. Okay. So how do we take that and and take that data into our marketing platform, which has a, a better view of that customer interacting across, across all of our brand and products and services to know that they're right in the moment for probably a message around that specific offering, as opposed to it's, it's kind of seeing this purpose built in, in one location and it's hard to mine that information for uh, a, more, a more cohesive journey. And that, I mean, I th the platforms are evolving to some extent with, with basic integrations, but I think as you get more to a headless approach, you really start to be, we can be a hub in the middle syndicating all the best of the be best of breed uh, and, and use that to create a, a more uh, like a single view pane of glass kind of journey for the customer. Thank you. Peter, do you also mind um, speaking about improved employee productivity? Uh, yes, we're, yes, we, uh, we were looking, some of the metrics like through COVID, we're definitely looking at efficiency in terms of um, are these are all the things we're working on together as a team helping drive um, some of the things like the how many units are we be able to sell uh, you know uh, per month on a consultant basis how much time is it taking through the through the process we still have work to do to tag some of those KPIs you know so we can really measure um, that experience um, both in the store as in the same way that we can do it more easily with some of those online KPIs. Um, similarly on our, our marketing, you know, how do we look at our marketing spend in aggregate and really make sure we're getting the ROI on any of those digital um, investments. And so we work really hard too to try and bring some of that in house and build uh, the team around more performance marketing and really localize content and, and have just now a lot more mechanisms to syndicate, hopefully more meaningful personalized journeys with our customers and make sure the investments are, are tying out so we can track um, I think attribution is definitely an opportunity across the space, though, whether it's attribution in the in-store experience or attribution in the online experience, because it's, you know, when you go to things like multi-touch attribution or more sophisticated models, then we can really start to understand, you know, with each area of investment, how, is, how can we reinvest in those that are contributing most to the customer going, you know, going further down the funnel or actually, you know, consummating the transaction. Thank you, Peter. And I will give my last question before we move on to attendee Q&A. 
Um, I do think this will be a fun one and it'll be a group question. Um, do you guys wanna discuss anything about the future um, and some interesting things that our attendees might, might find fun? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just had a conversation today, but um, let's preface it as futures, but this is pretty much being worked on now, if you, you know what I mean? But um, so in a sense, it's not, um, it's just imagination, the art of the possible. But it's, I think the one thing to think about when I speak with brands is high level, and then I'll go into the future piece. Um, and this is about the digital product experience is how much care, thoughtfulness are you putting into that entire experience digital? I, I want to go broad because a lot of them spend a lot of money, time, care, stores, where, where, where things are placed, right? I mean, there's a whole science behind it. I know that people know that, right? Car companies, the, the, the care that is put into building the car itself, the modeling, right? I mean, I, I appreciate as a consumer, I'm not an expert in that world, but I'm just saying, but then when it comes to the digital side, like, are you, are you doing the same? in that detail, uh, that's really, really, I think an important sort of like gut check. Cause if you're not, then that's really, that should give you pause. So number one, number two, back to like digital, I've spoken the examples before about, you know the experience on your website or, or like a concierge, but, but the pressure on the brands that we see in luxury, let's say goods, and you can argue cars are luxury goods, but is, is, is even more accelerated. I think it's coming here as well, which is the following um, social, right? I have a golf club. I'm on a social platform without naming one, right? Choose the one you want. Hey, Aaron, check out that club. There you go. Here you go. Try it out. That's literally what's, what's gonna happen soon. It's, it's very much possible today. So that's a very cool thing. So once you unlock that, it's like, well, wait a minute. My products can go anywhere they want. I can engage with them. The product is free. It's universal. It goes places. Um, the other one that we uh, start to talk about is, um, so that's the social platforms. And we can spend hours on this, right? But again, you know, most companies, by the way, go back to that real quick. They're still so, and for good reason, so much, so much is spent on physical experiences that once they understand the unlock of that, it's like, wait a minute, like that is quite powerful in itself. The other one is, um, games, right? We're, we're talking to multiple companies where games um, are being, um, let's see, I think it's bigger than Hollywood. I'm an expert on that in terms of billions of dollars and time spent. Um, why not have your product appear in the game? So you're engaging with it without naming game names. We can go forever where it's appropriate. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you enjoyed it. You configured it. It's yeah, you like it. Would you like to buy it? And I see you'll start seeing that in consumer goods, it's, you know, where it's going to be basically, that is my product. I'm glad you're enjoying it. You spent 12 hours with it. Maybe you personalize to the, to the point where it's, 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 it's so personal digitally, you want it yourself. Anyway, again, a topic can go on forever. But the, the one thing I just, with those two examples, I want to bring to the, to, to the point is that um, there's a lot of pressure by consumers, by us, ourselves, that want to see these products in lots of different places. So unlocking your product experience isn't just for the website. That, that was really my point. It's gonna be universal, so. If I can just add, Matt, I mean, to your point, I mean, th there are a lot of companies and also in the automotive space who are experimenting, right? They are experimenting with, you know, if you remember that evolution slide, they're experimenting with stage four and five. But I want to just reemphasize Peter's point earlier that like, if you don't have the foundational platform, right, even though you have something cool, that's a point, like a point experience in stage four and five, if you haven't changed your culture, your operations, your uh, technology platform, you're going to give the customer at the end still a stage two experience, right? They're going to still have to deal with like the boring, archaic process in the dealership, for example, right? So amazing, cool website, right? horrible buying experience, for example, right? Because they haven't fixed, to Peter's mm -hmm. point, that platform approach of looking at the future and connecting that, right? Because, um, and, they're, and they're just playing and trying point solutions, right? I don't know if, uh, uh, Peter, you want to kind of add on to that as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, I think uh, it's, it's mostly, if not 99%, about the people, the team, the orienting around it, the technology, we'll know it's going to iterate you know, very quickly. Um, I mean, nonetheless, having a, a platform that is proven to scale and grow and can evolve along with, 
with with but we don't know the answer is like I keep going back to that is is, is important. So we do invest a lot in training, getting feedback, working closely to be on the ground and get a, a, a true sense of how things are are happening. And one of the things we we've been trying to do is the same platform the customer is engaging with uh, when they hit our website, uh, which is you know, we're the biggest showroom we have, right? So most traffic is going through there. When we, when the customer arrives in store, it's a similar experience on a similar platform. It's a similar process uh, that we can walk through. So it helps the adoption on both sides and it gives us really good feedback too. Cause we may think, okay, the customer is gonna shop this way. And then the, our team will be like, no, nah, that's not how they do it. They're gonna be doing this and this and this. And then what if they have, have been three co-buyers and then but then at the end of the they want to switch the car out so you, you you start to learn a lot of the real flexibilities that have to be in play which which actually only make the online experience better because so we kind of we think of a platform that supports both they're not two different processes it's all running on the same tech stack and that in that case um you know we get the learnings really uh more uh from all sides really and then we're able to make changes that we know can support um, an assisted journey, uh, something the customer starts themselves and, and definitely something that the sales consultant helps them uh, complete in the store. Oh, yeah, tra tra training is a you know, tra training change management by far, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to, to trying to focus on that and, and build our operational KPIs around that too. And one point too around you know effectiveness and operations too is maybe it's, it's looking out. I know there's a lot of buzz around robotic process automation, and you know as we all probably know as anyone on, on as an automotive operator, this kind of swivel chair concept where you're working in a lot of different systems to kind of make one one transaction happen. So we're looking at mechanisms in lieu of open you know open platforms. How do we you kind of move the information in a secure way across using some of these more modern process automation techniques. And similarly in the back end too, if there's still a lot of paper in the process, um, not everywhere is is, is e-documentation as we would love. And, and we're still working with municipalities and regulatory groups too that have been banks. And you know, so you have to kind of look, you broaden that ecosystem in a very complex retail business. You know, having other mechanisms from a platform perspective like process automation to help solve some of those friction points more in the back end, yet still it, that makes its way into the customer experience uh, is, is well worth looking into too. Yeah, and I think Peter, if I can just, if I can just add in there, you know, we're having a lot of conversations with, with dealerships and distributors like yourself. And we talk a lot about the customer experience and, and Matt is absolutely right about, about the shift changing, but for, for a lot of dealerships, about it's about the employee experience as well, right? How can you make the employee experience more more efficient, more effective, more data driven, more in, insight led? Because up, up to date, the, the, the process has had roadblocks. It hasn't been uh, very effortless. There's been a lot of friction. You know, there's questions in the panel about F and I, about trade ins, uh, you know, about physically seeing the vehicle, about booking appointments. How do I physically get to the showroom? Is the car even in the right geo geolocation? And I think a lot of this is about making it making it uh, as seamless for the for the for the customers it is for the employees so that they can have a dynamic real time in, interaction at the pace of the customers choosing. And I think Peter, you're you're a long way on that on that journey now of of taking what is now a great customer experience and making sure it's the same for your employees so that they can focus more on on customer satisfaction, right, and on the outcomes rather than on admin and, and input. Right. I want to thank it you. back to you. Ooh, thank you. I want to thank you guys so much for a great discussion today. I am going to pass it back to Haley Dunn to close it out. Thank you so much, Kayla, for hosting. And thank you to our wonderful panel for all of your insights. I think we've had an extremely engaged audience. So we appreciate every single question that you've sent through. So without further ado, I would like to thank you all for attending today. We look forward to continuing insights through our Reuters Events Automotive Series. And thank you so much to Salesforce for partnering with us and making today possible. So we hope you enjoyed the discussion. And without further ado, goodbye all, good evening, or have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.